Hi, my name is Steve Pedagorski. I'm an artist and photographer living in uh, Northampton, Massachusetts. And I've been taking pictures since I was about 16 years old. I had uh, an older stepbrother who was interested in photography before I was, and he had built a darkroom in our family home outside of New York City. And when he went to college and the darkroom was empty, I thought to myself, well, it always looked interesting what he was doing down there. I think I'll try it. And I was lucky enough to have an art teacher in high school who was very supportive of my interest in photography and uh, encouraged me to continue. So um, that was a long time ago. I never had any idea what I would do with it, but I went to college and after taking many different courses in my first year, uh, I decided that I wanted to be an art major. And I still didn't know what part photography would play in my life, but I kept pursuing it. I was out of college for a few years, began to do some freelance work in photography and graphic design, uh, went to grad school later at the Rhode Island School of Design, and uh, one thing after another led to my having a career both as an artist and as a photographer. And in my uh, freelance work, even though I started out doing many different things, I ended up with a couple of specialties. One of them was photographing artwork for artists, galleries, museums, filmmakers, collections. And I also did a lot of work for lawyers representing people in personal injury cases. So uh, one day, a little more than 20 years ago, I was driving around with an artist friend of mine, a guy named Greg Stone, looking at his work in different places, uh, sculptures and paintings that I was going to photograph. And as we were driving around, he began talking to me about some friends of his, many of whom I knew, who were going to be gathering up unused prosthetic limbs and taking them to Nicaragua to donate to a clinic there and to look into issues of limb loss and disability in developing countries. And at the end of this long, rambling description of what he and his friends were going to be doing, he said to me, uh, is it the kind of thing you'd ever be interested in documenting for us? And I thought he was speaking in the general sense. And I said, yeah, it sounds like a good project. If they would pay my ticket, I would donate the time. I didn't think much more of it. And about a month later, he called me out of the blue. And he said, uh, we're going April 8th to the 18th. Can you go? And I thought, well, I don't know. I was teaching full time that year and had no idea whether I'd be able to swing that. But I was able to. And I went to Nicaragua with this group for 10 days in April of 1998. And it was absolutely a life-changing experience. Uh, in my work for the lawyers on personal injury cases, I thought that I had seen just about all there was to see of terrible things that had happened to people. But I had seen those things in the United States. And even though I had traveled a lot, I had never been to a country as poor as Nicaragua. And I had never been to a country that fairly recently had gotten through a revolution and then a civil war. And on the very first interview that we did with a man who had lost his leg uh, from a bullet wound in Nicaragua's Civil War, he was sitting on the couch of his home wearing his prosthetic leg. And he had two children, one a year older, one a year younger than my son was at that time, who were hugging him, who were climbing on him, who were examining his prosthetic leg, who fondled his stump when he took off the leg to show it to us. And all the while, he was telling this incredible story, the likes of which I had never heard before. He was describing how, when he first lost his leg, his children were afraid to be in the same room with him. They wouldn't come near him. People in the village began saying that his wife was going to leave him because he wasn't a whole man anymore. And it was staggering to me to hear this story and to understand that once he got this prosthetic limb, it changed his life. And Nicaragua, being a terribly poor country, the work that's available for people to do there in order to make any kind of a living is invariably physical. So when he had lost his leg, he lost his ability to gain income. He couldn't support his family. It affected his family, his neighbors, his neighborhood. And so it was clear to me in a flash that being a person with a disability meant something completely different in a country like Nicaragua compared to the people I had seen working for lawyers in the United States. And it was uh, a moment I'll never forget. 
And I spent an amazing time in Nicaragua, loved the country, loved the group I was working with, which is now called the Polis Center for Social and Economic Development. They were happy with the pictures that I came up with. And I said to them after the trip, you know, if you're going to keep doing this stuff, I'd be happy to stay involved, not having any idea what that meant. Well, it happened that the group was incredibly successful at uh, designing ways to assist people with disabilities and victims of conflict. And uh, we were able to start a prosthetics clinic in Nicaragua uh, a year and a half after that first visit, which is remarkable. Uh, as a non-governmental organization, it often takes years to accomplish anything. So for us to be able to create this clinic, which was of, by, and for Nicaraguans, a uh, year and a half later was an incredibly uh, exciting thing to have been involved with. Uh, we went on from there to do work in southern Honduras and start another clinic there. And uh, after a few trips with this group, mostly to Nicaragua and Honduras, where I had just been photographing for the group to create images that they could use to publicize, to inform, to educate, to include in reports to the funders who had backed the projects, I realized that after a few trips, I was starting to put aside pictures that I liked for myself as a photographer, uh, regardless of the way in which they might have helped the group. And up to that point as an artist, the work that I had done was, I was never a photojournalist, I wasn't a social documentary photographer, I was doing nothing like these pictures that I was starting to like. So it took me a while to accept that I was doing these pictures for myself as an artist, not just as a pro bono effort to assist the Polis Center. And uh, it took me a while to figure out what that meant and what I had to do about it, because I had really never practiced very much taking pictures of people a certain way. I'd done a lot of work in black and white landscape photography. Animals have always been a big part of my work. But here I was uh, traveling any time I could with this group. And uh, the group became uh, more and more successful at what it did. And over the years, that's meant now, 20 years later, that I have been on over 30 trips with this group. I've worked with them in Nicaragua, Honduras, Colombia, Peru, Ethiopia, Tajikistan, Jordan, and recently the Democratic Republic of Congo. So it's taken me all over the world. And uh, the images in this exhibit are a selection from 20 years of work, traveling with the group, documenting the work that they do, and the victims of conflict and people with disabilities that they assist. A lot of what allows me to make pictures like this, very intimate portraits often of people who have suffered, is that the Polis Center uses a very particular method to go about assisting victims of conflict and people with disabilities. And at the core of that method is a process based on something called model coherency planning, which is a very person-centered approach of interviewing people in a very open-ended way that gets them talking about their lives. So instead of using a checklist that says, what do you do for work? What are the problems with your limb? Instead, we just ask people very broad questions going way back to before whatever accident they experienced happened. So that means I'm often meeting people in their homes, at their farms, where they may work, uh, in places that allow very personal connections. And the Polo Center is always working with groups in a particular country that have already established a track record of working with people uh, who have suffered like this. So there's an element of trust that is established by the fact that we have done a lot of uh, groundwork to establish relations with groups and individuals before we ever set foot in a particular country. And in this process, we always start out by introducing ourselves and the members of the team who might conduct the interview. Uh, I've learned enough Spanish at this point to be able to say to people, if we're in Spanish-speaking countries, uh, who I am, where I'm from, what I do. And of course, we ask their permission about being photographed. And what's extraordinary for me is that I can think in 20 years of only one person we worked with who did not wish to be photographed, one out of hundreds. So I've been granted extraordinary access to people in uh, very difficult parts of their lives who have been gracious enough to trust us and to share their stories. I think they understand that what we do is very directly going to help improve their lives. And so even though we don't go in making promises, as I say, it's a group that has a good record. And the group's work is supported by many different sources. A principal one is a small spark a small part of the United States Department of State. 
The State Department has an agency called the Political Military Office of Weapons Removal and Abatement. And these are people who fly below political radar, who don't change with each administration, who spend their lives essentially helping victims of conflict. And they do that both by eliminating landmines from country to country, eliminating unexploded ordnance and explosive remnants of war, which plague communities uh, for decades after a conflict has ended. And they also support victim assistance, which the Polis Center does, and mine risk education. So very often they may ask a group that has an established track record of succeeding in funded projects to go and do an assessment project. They might say, would you be willing to go to Tajikistan and assess the status of landmine victims in that country? So if we agree, and I say we because I'm now on the board of the Polis Center, in addition to still being a volunteer photographer, if we agree, uh, we would receive a small amount of money to go to the country for a week, two weeks, whatever it takes, uh, interview people who have everything to do with the policies surrounding mine action, assistance to people with disabilities, whatever it may be, health and uh, human service organizations. But then most importantly, we would also go out into the field to interview victims and see if there is a gap between policy and implementation of policy. And based on that assessment visit, we would write a report and if the report includes recommendations for uh, significant ways in which improvements could be made to how victims are being assisted, the uh, Office of Weapons Removal and Abatement might then say, why don't you apply for a grant? And if the grant application is successful, they then might fund two years of work, work which we have outlined. In some cases, that might be establishing a prosthetics clinic. In other cases, it might be going in and uh, providing prosthetic assistance or training people in an existing clinic how to improve their capacity. It might involve providing uh, social counseling, psychological counseling, vocational training. Whatever it is that our interviews uh, tell us when we analyze the information, what it is the particular people we met, the unique individuals that we met, uh, most need in order to improve their lives. So for example, we've worked a lot in Colombia in regions where coffee has grown with a lot of small coffee farmers who were victims of uh, 52 years of conflict between the uh, various guerrilla forces that have waged war there, uh, paramilitaries who attacked them, the armies who attacked both of those groups, and very often these farmers uh, have problems making ends meet. And if we interviewed them and a man would say, well, I just need money to buy medicine for my wife. We might, by the time we get through analyzing the information gained from the interview, say that, well, what this guy really needs is new coffee plants because his have been affl afflicted by one disease or another. They're not being very productive. The best way we can help him is not to give him money, but to give him new plants from which he can harvest coffee year after year and make a living in an ongoing way and not be in any way dependent on, on us or charity or any <clears throat> temporary and more limited forms of assistance. And for me, you know, asking me to talk is a little bit like asking me to breathe. And you know, this work has become so important to me, uh, not just as a photographer, but as a person. It's a little hard to describe, but uh, first of all, you know, I've traveled a lot as a tourist, and that's wonderful. That's a unique opportunity for anybody to have. This kind of work is pretty much the opposite of tourism. We are often going to places that are remarkably poor, uh, seeing people in areas that are remarkably remote and uh, that are nowhere near whatever tourist attractions might be in a particular country. But that means I get to know people as people, as individuals, and I get to see things about them and their lives and their families and their work and their struggles in ways that I would never learn about just traveling as a tourist. So when I describe to work, uh, this work to people, often the response is, oh, it's so wonderful that you're doing this work. A and to be honest, I don't think of myself as a saint. I think of myself as somebody who's remarkably lucky to do this, to travel, to learn so much uh, about the world, about the way an incredibly large percentage of the world works. And so it humanizes you, it uh, forces you to have an awareness of things that in many ways we might rather not be aware of. Um, the devastation of armed conflict, 
the ways in which innocent people continue to be injured when they're clearing land on their farm with a machete and strike a grenade that was left over from one war or another. You know, these are horrible, horrible things that very sadly continue to this day. Even though many countries in the world have signed on to something called the Ottawa Accord, which bans the use of landmines, which obliges signatories to destroy their stockpiles of landmines and to assist victims, there are still plenty of conflicts in Yemen and plenty of other places in which landmines are being used extensively. So sadly, the need for the work that the Polis Center is doing is going to go on for quite a while. So that is uh, a terribly sad fact, but one happy fact that offsets that is that it is indeed not that difficult to help these people improve their lives. It just isn't. Uh, it takes more um, determination and basic understandings of human needs and how to solve certain problems than any kind of advanced degrees or rocket science. So I'm very proud of this work um, because I think it helps me be a better person to be aware of these things uh, on a broad scale that we in this country, fortunately, uh, do not have much awareness of.